Hello, my name is Mark Hendricks. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer and co-founder of AIM Geoanalytics, a geological consulting firm based in Missoula, Montana. Today, I'm gonna to present the first of a five-part webinar that describes the basic geological background and historic production associated with the Phosphoria Formation, one of the biggest petroleum systems in North America and arguably the world. So with that very brief introduction, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll go ahead and get started. So the official title of my presentation is the Permian Phosphoria Formation and Equivalent Strata in the Northern Rockies and Great Basin Regions. On the right, you see a small section of rock core that's been cut from the Phosphoria in the Bighorn Basin of Wyoming. The core shows a variety of lithophases, including some ripple laminated packstone here, uh, locally some chert nodules, as you can see here and here and here, and uh, a more massive section on the left that shows a uh, moldic porosity that is actually uh, filled with liquid hydrocarbons. All right, so this webinar is divided into five weeks. Each has its own presentation, and this is the presentation for the first week. So the first week focuses on just introducing the paleogeography and the stratigraphy of the Phosphoria formation. Well, as I mentioned in, the, in the, the beginning, the Phosphoria is the basis for uh, one of the biggest petroleum systems in North America, and it is a world-class system. Uh, this slide summarizes 10 years of, of production data uh, from four basins in Wyoming, and you see the basins over here on the left. Uh, these numbers were compiled by the U.S. Geological Survey for production that occurred between 1994 and 2004. On the right, you see the percentage of production that's interpreted to have come from the phosphoria, including both liquid hydrocarbons and millions of barrels of oil equivalent and um, BCF of, of gas. Bottom line here is over this 10 year period, the phosphoria is interpreted to have produced or sourced uh, 357 million barrels of oil and about a billion and a half uh, cubic feet of gas. It's important to note again that these numbers represent uh, oil and gas that's interpreted to have been sourced from the phosphoria, and, uh, but it's been produced uh, from reservoirs that include, but are not limited to the phosphoria. So this is phosphoria sourced oil here. All right, looking at the extent of the phosphoria uh, formation and its uh, stratigraphic equivalents, here on the left, we see a map of the Northern Rocky Mountain regions, Wyoming, Idaho, Montana, um, showing the overall extent of the phosphoria formation here in the dashed black line and the, um, the extent where uh, the phosphoria is, is produced economic phosphate, phosphates used in fertilizers and other, uh, other critical uh, uses. On the right, what we're looking at is a partial stratigraphic column. It's actually a chronostratigraphic chart uh, from several Wyoming basins. You can see the Green River Basin here on the left, Great Divide and Washakie basins here on the right, and then the far right, the San Wash Basin. Notice that this uh, chronostratigraphic chart only covers uh, the Paleozoic, so Cambrian through Permian, and the lower part or the early part of the Mesozoic. So it only includes the Triassic and the Jurassic. Uh, the Cretaceous is not included because uh, there is an entirely different petroleum system um, in the Cretaceous strata of these, these basins. The gold color here highlights the stratigraphic sections from which phosphoria sourced oil has been produced in each of these four basins. The two, and so you can see that it, it the, the phosphoria has been produced from, uh, from formations that are underlying the actual phosphoria formation, as well as overlying um, the phosphoria formation, but yet again, below the Cretaceous. The two green highlights here show the two uh, organic rich uh, parts of the phosphoria that have produced this oil. These are two members. The lower is called the Mead Peak member and the upper member here is called the Retort member. We'll cover these in much more detail as we go on. So again, as you can see, the Phosphoria has charged most, if not all of the uh, porous permeable siliciclastic and carbonate strata that are below the Cretaceous in these, uh, in these basins. We're gonna look at the differences in geochemistry between these Phosphoria oils and the Cretaceous oils in the overlying petroleum system uh, next week when we start looking at some of the geochemistry. 
Okay, here's a little more regional chronostratigraphic chart focusing simply on Permian and Triassic rocks across much of the Rocky Mountain region. Starting on the left, you see locations here in the southern part of the Fosforia Basin, uh, Nevada, Utah, Colorado. And then in the middle here, we're looking at the central portion of the Fosforia Basin, so most of the Wyoming basins. And then far on the right here, we start getting into the northern part of the basin, which includes uh, Montana. Also shown here are the uh, are black dots and open circles with the horizontal line that represent uh, 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 conventional reservoirs that are charged with phosphoria oil in these different basins, and then conventional res reservoirs charged with phosphoria gas in these basins. The other thing I want to point out here is that these two black highlighted uh, portions of the chronostratigraphic chart refer to the two organic ridge intervals, the Mead Peak being the lower one and the retort being the upper one here. And again, we'll, we'll examine these in a lot more detail a little bit later on. All right, well, let's take a quick look at what was going on during Permian time when the Phosphoria formation and its, its equivalents were deposited. Remember that the Permian was a time of serious environmental stress uh, in terms of global climate change. Uh, if we think back to the Devonian and the Carboniferous, there was all kinds of carbon sequestration in the form of massive coal deposits. And this sequestration of carbon drew down atmospheric CO2 levels uh, because once the carbon was fixed by photosynthesis, uh, and it was buried and effectively removed from the system. So this decreasing CO2 in the late carbon, uh, by the late Carboniferous led to a, a major global glaciation. It was most pro pronounced in, the, in Gondwana but uh, it did affect the entire globe. Well, by Permian time, however, the, 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 the Pangean supercontinent had formed and uh, it really gave rise to a major reduction in the rate of CO2 sequestration or carbon, organic carbon sequestration. And this actually led to global warming that followed this, this, uh, this um, glaciation. That global warming slowed down the thermohaline circulation in the oceans and ultimately uh, it is thought to have led to widespread oceanic anoxia. And that's what happened then uh, during the, the time that the, the uh, that certainly what happened during the time the Permian, the Phosphoria was deposited and in the Phosphoria Basin itself. Uh, one notices uh, here, if, if looking at the, the uh, total um, uh, rate of evaporate accumulation during during um, late Carboniferous and uh, sorry during late Permian time we see it's a ma there's a major increase here and that's because again uh, we see a uh, uh, this global warming trend and uh, also uh, we have a lot of uh, of arid environments associated with the big continental climate uh, of Pangaea. Uh, the two colored highlights on the sea level curve here on the left show the um, the two brown intervals show the the two organic rich portions of the phosphoria, the mead peak on the bottom and the retort. And then the uh, green, the blue highlights here uh, represent times of carbonate deposition. All right, taking a little more uh, regional look at Permian paleogeography at 275 million years before present. So that's just slightly before uh, the phosphoria was deposited. So here's 275 and you see phosphoria started about two, 270 and it's thought to be uh, as young as about 257 or so. Um, so uh, here's the overall configuration and you can see the outline of the states here and the Canadian provinces just to get you oriented. Uh, the big mountain range that we can see here is uh, the Appalachian chain that stretches from, um, from the east coast of modern North America down through the Ouachita's and actually into West Texas. Uh, this is South America, which is undergoing a continent-continent collision at this time. And then sort of behind this, this more detailed map, you, there's a little bit of Africa shown here, which was also involved in this continent-continent collision. So we see the assembly of Pangaea, and um, we are located here in this inset box. So taking a closer look at that, um, we have, uh, first of all, the, uh, the active tectonic margin on the western side of the Pangaean supercontinent. This is a complicated active margin that, that, um, that had associated with it a fairly um, uh, complicated archipelago of islands that uh, more or less isolated the open ocean here from the basins here in Wyoming and Utah and, and uh, Idaho that ultimately gave rise to the Phosphoria. So it's in these basins that the Phosphoria was deposited. 
All right, if we look at the surface wind configuration and think about the paleogeographic setting here, uh, the Phosphoria Basin is about 15 degrees north of the paleo equator. And in thinking about the modern world and how modern surface winds behave and applying that to this Permian scenario, uh, we have basically a series of trade winds that are the northeasterly trades that are gonna be coming off of the Pangean continent and moving across the Phosphoria Basin um, somewhat parallel to the shore, but also obliquely offshore. All right, well, let me uh, move on and talk a little bit about the dynamics of oceanic upwelling. And that's a phenomenon that is uh, widely interpreted to have resulted in the deposition, not only of the phosphate uh, that for which the phosphoria is named, but also all of the organic matter that sourced um, the petroleum and natural gas that we described earlier and that has been produced from Northern Rockies basins. So uh, this is again a, a schematic sketch of uh, an upwelling zone. On the left, we see a couple of, of plots. The first showing marine water depth here in meters and dissolved oxygen. And that's the red curve right here. You can see that, that there's uh, quite a bit of dissolved oxygen near the surface waters because of wave mixing. And then in contrast, as you get deeper and particularly as you get down below this 200 meter depth, uh, the dissolved oxygen drops off significantly and it can stay low all the way to the bottom. Uh, and so um, the pink curve, the other curve here represents the amount of the concentration of dissolved phosphate in parts per billion. And uh, recall that phosphate is a critical nutrient. We all need it to live and phytoplankton and plankton does as well. And so as soon as that dissolved phosphate is, uh, is made available, it's snapped up by the surface plankton. And so at the surface, uh, we have very little dissolved phosphate. You see again, that this phosphate increases its concentration at about the same time that the oxygen begins to drop off. And that's not a coincidence. What happens is the plankton here in the surface waters begin to die and sink through the, the water column. And then when they reach about 200 meters and that's below the photic zone, uh, they begin to undergo decay. And the decay, which is uh, happens through the decomposition using uh, bi excuse me, bi-aerobic bacteria and they require oxygen to do their uh, their, for their metabolism and to break down this organic carbon, um, that those organic, those aerobic bacteria use up this oxygen. And uh, they also partially decay the organic matter that's sinking to the bottom. And that partial decay liberates dissolved phosphate back into the water column. And then that stays high pretty much all the way uh, to the bottom. All right. Well, if we look to the right, we see here uh, at the top by way of these symbols, the seasonal prevalent wind. So recall in the Phosphoria case, we're looking at, at northeasterly trades that are blowing to the south southwest, and that's more or less parallel to the paleo shoreline. Uh, because, because of the Coriolis effect, uh, the shoreline parallel wind shear actually drives water offshore. And that's the really important physical part of this upwelling zone because it's this offshore water driving that causes the water from about this zone of uh, low oxygen, high phosphate, around two to 400 meters water to be upwelled to the surface. And this effectively fertilizes the surface and results in the high productivity that, um, that we see typical of upwelling zones that we think happened in the case of the phosphoria formation. All right, if we recall then uh, for the complicated paleobathymetry that we saw on the on the paleogeographic maps with the Phosphoria Basin being inboard of that big archipelago of islands, uh, we can uh, easily imagine that the, the basin itself likely had a series of sills, bathymetric sills, that allowed the Phosphoria Basins to at times go completely anoxic. So this anoxia or this dysoxia that we see uh, between about 200 and 400 meters could actually extend all the way to the bottom. And it's this anoxia that really contributed to the preservation of all the organic carbon that we see in the phosphoria that ultimately led, of course, to the petroleum and natural gas that's been produced across the northern Rockies. All right, well, here's a regional cross-section through the Phosphoria Basin showing its stratigraphy. This is a cross-section that was adapted um, or uh, adapted, yes, by the U.S., uh, by us. Uh, it was originally published by the U.S. Geological Survey uh, based on work they did in the 40s and 50s, and it was ultimately published in their big professional uh, paper number 313. So this cross-section stretches from the east, that's eastern Wyoming, southeastern Wyoming, the Rattlesnake Hills, west across the Wyoming-Idaho line 
line ultimately into southeastern Idaho where we see the sublet range. Notice the vertical scale here. So we're looking at about 100 meters of rock and uh, with this scale bar here. And of course, we were looking at a fairly wide, uh, long cross section here. I'd like to point out, first of all, that there's a tremendous amount of depositional, depositional thickening that happens here in the western part of the Phosphoria. And that's the first point. The second point I'd like to make here is that there's quite a bit of stratigraphic complexity. So we go from basically a carbonate evaporated dominated system here near the shoreline to a more offshore shelfal region that has a series of carbonates and these organic rich mudstones uh, that are phosphatic to a, to a more basinal setting that's largely dominated by uh, siliceous mudstone and including some of the phosphatic mudstones, but also including a lot of, a lot of chert um, that has uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, sponge debris and sponge spicules associated with. So this is, this is almost certainly biogenic term. Again, notice the two major uh, organic rich intervals, the lower of which is the Mead Peak, the upper of which is the retort. And um, these are the two, uh, the two organic rich intervals that are thought to have produced or have sourced all the oil and gas that we're describing uh, earlier. All right, one last slide uh, to look at some of this stratigraphic complexity that characterizes the phosphoria in just a little bit more detail. These are three cross sections that were adapted by work from John, uh, from uh, Jack Peterson. And um, you can see the first cross section A to A prime here goes across northern Wyoming, B, to B prime stretches across uh, the western part of, part of Wyoming, and C to C prime here uh, stretches across the, the southern part of the state right here. So uh, the main point on this slide is that the phosphoria contains at least three sequence boundaries and they're highlighted uh, by these, these uh, red squiggly lines right here. Um, the, the lower most of these sequences is incomplete and only includes um, the uppermost carbonate uh, portion of the sequence, but the upper two sequences are much more complete. So uh, we're going from this sequence boundary right here at the base of the Mead Peak up to the base of the retort, and then from the base of the retort up to the top of this carbonate system right here. So this series of lithophases within each, each sequence uh, from mudstone to overlying carbonates and cherts is interpreted to represent deposition during transgression and high stand, followed by the sequence boundary being cut by, um, by falling stage systems tract and or falling stage sea level, uh, relative sea level and, and low stand. Lastly, um, you'll notice here that these carbonates appear to be localized. In fact, they appear to have formed over paleo highs that were, uh, were forming Pina contemporaneously during Permian time as these rocks, as these sediments were being deposited. And that Pina contemporaneous uplift of, of, of different parts of the Phosphoria Basin actually uh, contributed significantly to the stratigraphic variation we see across the Phosphoria Basin. So that's it for week one. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and look at the Phosphoria Petroleum System in more detail next week and look in a little bit more detail at some of the geochemistry that characterizes it. We'll also compare it to the Cretaceous uh, Petroleum System that I mentioned earlier. So for AMGO Analytics, this is Mark Hendricks. See you next week.